Saddam Hussein has vowed to turn the Gulf crisis into a holy war. To that end, he has urged his worldwide followers to conduct acts of terrorism. CNN Special Assignment's Stephen Emerson takes us inside the organization of Abu Ibrahim, the godfather of the Iraqi terrorism movement. He's known as the master bomb maker. Special Assignment has exclusive interviews with two former members of Abu Ibrahim's group. As coalition planes and missiles attack Iraqi strategic targets, Saddam Hussein summons Iraq to war. And the great battle has been initiated, the mother of all battles. The open war that Hussein has promised on the ground and the hidden war to be waged by terrorists. This man will be in the vanguard of Hussein's hidden war. His name, Abu Ibrahim. His specialty, virtually invisible terrorist bombs. His operations in the 1980s, deadly and worldwide. 1982, Hawaii. An Abu Ibrahim bomb explodes inside Pan Am Flight 830. A teenager is killed. 1986, Greece. Another bomb kills four people on board this TWA jet. 1989, West Africa. A French airliner blows apart above the desert. 170 people are killed. The super secretive terrorist, Abu Ibrahim, never claims credit for his operations. This portrait, obtained by CNN, is the only picture known to exist of Abu Ibrahim. Western law enforcement officials know what they know about Abu Ibrahim because of this man. Joe is a Palestinian businessman who became an Abu Ibrahim courier. Joe was sent to bomb a hotel in Switzerland in 1982. Torn by misgivings about his first mission, Joe turned himself into American officials, providing them with a first description of the elusive Abu Ibrahim. I mean, very scary, man, very strong, very serious. And just, if you name America and Israel in front of him, he got crazy. And he never laughing. Never. <laughs> Intelligence analysts assert that Abu Ibrahim is part of Saddam Hussein's inner circle and works directly with Iraqi military intelligence. Joe confirms this. And he's very important with Iraqi government. They work together, the Iraq, they give him everything he wants, like houses, money, car. Uh, they make it easy for him about any mission. In the hidden war, Abu Ibrahim operatives number more than 100 worldwide. Based in the Middle East, Asia, and Europe, they are supported by a network of safe houses and often use Iraqi diplomatic facilities for operations. Abu Ibrahim recruits for bombing missions must look the part. If you want to send somebody for a restaurant or disco or hotel or plane, they send somebody, normal people, nice dress, nice looking. Abu Ibrahim's favorite method is to dupe nice dressed, nice looking women to take bombs unwittingly onto planes. He calls this technique the one-way bomb. And he makes sure 90% the lady, she carries the bomb, she has no background, like family or somebody ask about her. Fuad Hussein Shara was one of Abu Ibrahim's recruits. In 1983, he befriended an English woman in Greece. He gave her a suitcase to take on an LL flight, which he said contained religious items. What was in the suitcase? The book one side. Mm -hmm. Yes. But I don't uh, see it. He disappeared. It. When was the bomb supposed to explode? He, like he said, from uh, when she go from uh, Israel to London. But the bomb failed to explode. In 1985, Shara's next mission, to bomb the Israeli embassy in Singapore. That bomb did explode. Shara now awaits trial in Tel Aviv for this bombing. Abu Ibrahim is unlikely to be brought to trial. He is under indictment in the United States for terrorist acts, but remains under the protection of the Iraqi government. 
He has now gone on to teach a new generation the art of making undetectable bombs. Bombs that may be used against the West in what Saddam Hussein calls the mother of all battles. Stephen Emerson, CNN, special assignment. And coming up, a trip to a community near California's Camp Pendleton where Marine wives watch and wait for news in the Gulf. And another critical conflict, an update on the Soviet crackdown in the Baltics and White House reaction to that crisis. These stories and more coming up. Those guys always seem a step ahead of us. She said, I flew to see the prospect and they'd already been there. He said, they've got fewer people than we do. How can they move so fast? In business, you're either using Skytail's nationwide pages with voicemail or chasing someone who does. Skytail, that great communication system in the sky. For more information, call 1-800-456-ALL-3s. Come on. I know there's one. Ah, yes. We're in luck, Mr. Cheney. We have one room left. Thanks, Donna. I hate to turn guests away, particularly our regulars. Sometimes they don't make reservations. Too busy. I can usually get them a room at the holiday, but they have to pay more. Room 312. Maybe that's one reason we're full. Ramada, 1-800-228-2828. Grapefruit! Should be eaten in the morning, and only in half. The man who wrote the book on Florida grapefruit is out the door. You don't just have to have it in the morning. You can feel it any time you feel it. Spice it if you like it as a treat. You just can't beat it. Florida grapefruit anytime. Grapefruit, fresh from Florida and Florida's Indian River. You don't just have to have it in the morning. I get this awful sinus pain. These sinus pain formulas all made news in the 80s. They all have the same medicine. Today's news is Tristan Sinus, the only sinus medicine with ibuprofen. It relieves my sinus pain wherever it strikes. New Tristan Sinus. I'm the one sticking his neck out. They turn to him for help. What would you do if you were alone? I'd risk it. Now there's no turning back. Sybil Shepherd, John Waters, a TNT exclusive premiere. Which Way Home? Monday on TNT. CNN's Dan Blackburn is standing by live now in Oceanside, California, near Camp Pendleton. And a lot of people there have loved ones in the Gulf region. Dan tells us how they're coping in this crisis. Dan? Well, Catherine, Oceanside, California is a town wreathed in yellow ribbons because so many men and women from this area now are on, on duty in the Persian Gulf. Among them is the husband of Mary Ortega. Mary remains here, of course with the three children, two of whom have uh, joined us, the two older boys. There are three boys in all. Tony and Matthew are with us, and uh, Jacob is sound asleep behind us. How are you all doing, Mary? We're doing real good with the help of the military. We've got our support groups, and they have programs for the children, the older children, if they need help and stuff. When you say with the help of the military, what does the military do to help out? Well, um, if you run into financial problems, you've got your Navy relief, and if you... Uh, emotional problems they've got uh, psychologists there you know for children for adults and they've got uh, I mean any any help anything that you can run into you're sure to get the help from the military they've been really good about that how do you all do when you're watching the news on television you see the news from over there well <clears throat> at first it was kind of hard you know because everything just all of a sudden happened and it was kind of hard um, mm -hmm. But now it's, it, I'm, well, I feel kind of guilty to say this, but it's kind of like a sign of relief that this is finally happening. So I feel it started, so now I'm looking forward to the ending. So, I don't know, I feel kind of guilty to say that, but I just feel kind of relief in a way. Uh, how are the boys holding up? Um, real good. Um, the, the two littlest, they really don't understand what's going on. Um, my oldest uh, talks to Daddy on the phone once in a while. And um, 
he enjoys that and my husband sends him pictures and letters and drawings and stuff and he really enjoys that uh once in a while he'll start missing him like you know anybody does you know and um Mom. He'll break down, but he does pretty good. Mama. You know? I just explained to him, Dad Mama. has a lot of work to Mama. do. Mama. Mama. Yeah. Mama. I understand. I understand too that you're getting some kind of interesting souvenirs from time to time. Oh yeah, I've got a Pepsi can from Fadi, and I've got a Coke can, M and M's, uh, Kool Aid, money. I've, he sent me sand and a lot of things, a lot of different things. Yeah. And and all of you wives uh, pretty much stay in close touch. Oh yeah, we've got ourselves. We got our. Um, we have a one big meeting once a month. That's the whole company uh, meeting, and then we have uh, separate support groups also, like once every two weeks or so. Okay, Mary, Mary Ortega, thank you very much for joining us. I'm Dan Blackburn, CNN Live in Oceanside, California. Nice pair of future Marines. In other news, in Moscow, Mikhail Gorbachev promised Tuesday to root out the reason force was used in quelling uprisings in the Baltic republics. Gorbachev's promise was made after a decision of the Baltic situation, after a discussion of it, rather, with Latvia's president in Moscow. In Latvia, the vigil continues outside the parliament building in the capital of Riga, where five people were killed by special Soviet troops on Sunday. Barricades around the parliament and other strategic buildings now are reinforced by troops and trucks, freshly deployed since Sunday's attack. In Washington, Secretary of State James Baker turned his attention to the Soviet crackdown in the Baltics, meeting with officials of Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania at the State Department. CNN World Affairs correspondent Ralph Begleiter reports. Preoccupation with the Persian Gulf War has kept the Baltics crackdown on the Bush administration's back burner, but Secretary of State James Baker held a high visibility meeting with three officials of the governments of Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia. The United States and Soviet Union have uh, made tremendous progress over the course of the last uh, two years uh, in improving the relationship between our two countries and the uh, events of the last 10 days to two weeks or so i'm afraid to say could have the effect of putting that progress in jeopardy the u.s is trying to determine whether the military crackdown in the baltics which has already led to almost two dozen deaths and many more injuries has the support of soviet president mikhail gorbachev who said the events in Lithuania and Latvia in no way expressed the line of presidential rule. Mikhail Gorbachev's claim that uh, he, he didn't know what was going on in, in Jan early January and he doesn't know what is going on now is, uh, is just like uh, the piano player sitting in the living room of a house of ill repute having played the piano for ten, there for 10 years, claims he still doesn't know what was going on upstairs. Both the House and Senate are considering calling for a cutoff of agricultural and economic trade benefits the U.S. granted to the Soviets only last month. The Bush administration is reluctant to do that, but officials are reviewing their options, which include cutting off trade benefits, postponing the next summit meeting, formalizing complaints through the European Cooperation Conference, which the Soviets have backed, and threatening to withdraw support for a human rights conference in Moscow next year. Baltic leaders say the U.S. is being indecisive and charged the Soviets with deliberately timing their crackdown to coincide with the Gulf War. Uh, they, they couldn't have the courage to begin actions in Baltic without the war. The Bush administration now regrets that it did not send a clear message to Saddam Hussein prior to his August 2nd invasion of Kuwait. The administration must now act to prevent any miscalculation by Soviet officials in this crisis. The administration is not letting the Baltics crackdown get in the way of continuing arms control negotiations. Uh, with respect to arms control particularly, we think it's important to move that process forward. A top Soviet negotiator is in Washington to put finishing touches on the long-range nuclear missile treaty the two sides want to sign at the scheduled February summit in Moscow. The administration hopes to complete the treaty and get it signed before politics in the Soviet Union make that impossible. So U.S. officials insist a decision on whether to go ahead with next month's Moscow summit has not been made. Ralph Begleiter, CNN at the State Department.
and how the Jewish press in the United States is covering the war in the Gulf and the attacks on Israel still to come right after this. It begins at dawn. They've come for you. And they want what you have. It's your bed. You're sort of perfect sleeper. But it's the most comfortable spot in the house. The Serta surface and support only Serta builds in makes it that way. So if it gets a little late for breakfast, there's always brunch. Is it any wonder people are saying, I want my Serta? Come on, Tyler, hurry up, boy. Come on, Tyler. When it's cold and rough outside, on, Tyler. try something warm and creamy inside. Cream of wheat hot cereal or instant cream of wheat. Their smooth texture always lets the taste come through. Again? Two warm ways to come in from the cold. The stress headache. When its pain stretches you to the limit, take aspirin free Anison 3. I take Anison 3 for the pain. It's not aspirin, it doesn't upset my stomach. Anison 3, aspirin free pain relief for today's stress headache. Bring your latest output to Pip Printing and we'll prove to the entire business community that you're doing more on your computer than zapping mutant slimoids from the Zorag Nebula. Pip Printing. Give us a call. We'll show you why we're the biggest business printer in the world. As the war in the Gulf continues, CNN is the network for the most complete coverage. From the Middle East and around the world, now more than ever, stay with the world's news leader, CNN. AIDS protesters disrupted two network newscasts earlier tonight, objecting to heavy war coverage and not enough reporting on AIDS. In New York, on the CBS Evening News, they charged the set in the opening moments of the broadcast. This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting. Good evening. We're going to take a break for a commercial. We'll break for a commercial. Thank you very much. Other protesters interrupted the public broadcasting service McNeil Lehrer News Hour. A PBS representative says during tonight's broadcast, three protesters chained themselves to a desk. One even tried to chain himself to anchor Robin McNeil. Both groups of protesters were removed from the TV studios and turned over to police. The United States Jewish press is working to inform their readership of what is happening in the Gulf. We have this report from CNN's Jim Hill. As the Gulf War continues, one small part of the American press is trying in a special way to bring the conflict into focus. Jewish community newspapers are filling their pages with the news of war and, in particular, its effect on Israel and Jews everywhere. They're intensely interested. They swallow up every bit of news that's available, and they, they want more and more. We're trying to, to satisfy that need. The New York area's half dozen Jewish newspapers serve some of the largest Jewish communities in the U.S. People watching as Israel teeters on the edge of war. Every week when I see the paper, I try to see the world news that what happened, what's going to be. I retire to pray to God that we should, should be over as soon as possible. New York's Jewish Week newspaper takes frequent phone reports from journalists in Israel. Did you really feel that you might have been in a life or death situation? But it also specializes in analytical pieces on war, as well as articles with religious insights. Well, essentially, we try to give our readers what uh, we, we know they won't find anywhere else. The weekly newspaper Forward is perhaps the oldest Jewish newspaper in the country. 
It maintains three correspondents in Israel to feed a steady stream of news. But it also relies heavily on specialized articles, what the editor calls over-the-horizon reporting. Scouting out what is ahead in the policy debate and uh, in the uh, political uh, arena uh, as a result of the war. The Jewish papers certainly know the events of the Gulf War may affect Israel far into the future, that alliances are changing, that boundaries may change as well, and that Jewish readers will demand more of their newspapers to try to foresee these changes that are yet to come. Jim Hill for CNN, New York. And that's the hour. Stay with CNN for the very latest in the Gulf War. I'm Catherine Cryer. Good night, David. Good night, Catherine. I'm David French, and we have a program note. Coming up at 1.30 a.m. Eastern Time, psychologist Sonia Friedman will host a call-in program. Her guest, the noted child psychologist Dr. Lee Salk, who will take your calls about the war's impact on children. just how much difference there is in life insurance rates from one insurance company to the next? For instance, if you're in good health and don't smoke cigarettes, Geico Life Insurance may be able to save you as much as 50% off the cost of your life insurance. That's right, 30, 40, 50% off what you'd have to pay for a comparable amount of coverage elsewhere. And not just this month, but year after year for the rest of your life. Savings like that are well worth looking into. So if you need $100,000 to $1 million or more of quality term life insurance, you owe it to yourself to check with GEICO Life. Get the facts fast by calling now, 800-257-1257, toll free for this free information package, including a personal coverage proposal that shows you just how much your savings might be. There's no obligation, no sales pressure, and it could be a real eye-opener. For instance, if you're a healthy 40-year-old male who doesn't smoke cigarettes, you may qualify for $100,000 worth of quality term life insurance at rates so low they're less than 60 cents a day. How do we do it? First, you save because we offer this life insurance at these low rates only to people who are in good health. That cuts our risk and your premium. Then, because this quality term life insurance is sold in amounts of at least $100,000 or more, you get the advantage of volume discounts. And it's easy to do business with GEICO Life because you deal with us directly. You're always just a phone call away. So call today, 800-257-1257. Toll free, 800-257-1257 for your free information and personal coverage proposal. No obligation, no pressure. Discover how this quality term life insurance could save you as much as 50% off your premiums every year for the rest of your life. 800-257-1257. Toll free. Call GEICO Life Insurance for your free information package today. 800-257-1257. This is CNN. Despite the launch of U.S. Patriot missiles, an Iraqi Scud missile slams into Tel Aviv. And Israel registers its first deaths of the Gulf War. CNN's car continues. Good evening. I'm Patrick Greenlaw. And I'm Susan Rook. Here's the latest. A classic terrorist act by a classic terrorist, Israel says. After three days of relative calm, fear has again struck Tel Aviv, again brought by an Iraqi Scud missile, this time causing scores of injuries and death. CNN's Richard Blystone with more. After a day of tiptoeing back toward normality, fireworks over the Tel Aviv area. Patriot missiles, bright golden arcs, streaked into the low clouds and lit them up like Japanese lanterns. But one Scud missile got through. 
A quarter of a ton of concentrated hatred slammed into a residential neighborhood. One house took a direct hit, and windows and shutters were broken for three blocks around. Emergency crews swarmed around the neighborhood. Heavy machinery shifting debris. Rescue workers trying to free people trapped in the rubble. At a Tel Aviv hospital, a stream of wounded civilians. We all were in the house, in the room. We put on the mask and we listened to the news. But uh, after a minute, uh, there was a big explosion and uh, all the walls that fell, fell on us. At the first time, we thought that uh, we all dead. I, I didn't hear anybody and I, I couldn't see anything. It was all dust, you know, from the walls. But after a while, uh, we... Uh, we took uh, the child from under the, the wall, the wall just fell on her, so I took her, um, took her out and uh, we found each other. Would Israel now abandon restraint, the Defense Force spokesman was asked. I can assure you that Israel will stick to its policy and to its right to self-defense. We are not going to tolerate such things, but at the same time we have uh, a lot of patience and we figure out the time and the place what to do. After three and a half days of peace, fear had come back to Tel Aviv. But the military says the normalization won't be halted. Israelis will just have to carry on. The people had looked to the patriots for deliverance from fear. The authorities said to the people, in effect, keep your fear a while, it'll be safer that way. It turned out the authorities were right. Richard Blystone, CNN, Tel Aviv. And as we heard in that report, the renewed Iraqi missile attacks on Israel have revived the question of how long Israel will refrain from retaliating. As CNN's Charles Bierbauer reports, with each attack, it will be harder for the United States to restrain Israel. The attack on Israel added urgency to an already scheduled presidential briefing with key security advisors. A White House statement calls the latest Iraqi missile attack a brutal act of terror, a continued example of Iraq's unprovoked aggression. Israel, the statement says, has shown remarkable restraint. The Israelis were not fortunate enough to escape serious casualties in the latest attack. Each attack raises the question of how long the Bush administration can convince the Israelis to delay their inevitable retaliation. It's not the matter of an eye for an eye, it's the matter of how to act in the best way in order to defend our population and in order to prevent further attacks in the future. While the Israeli government may hear an official U.S. plea for still more restraint, there are many in America who think Israel has taken enough. I know the gut, uh, the gut of many Israelis probably is, is to retaliate just to, to, uh, to retaliate for this vicious attack. I think Saddam Hussein himself might find himself uh, a very real target, and I believe that uh, that certainly would be appropriate. The first Scud attacks caused minimal physical damage, but rattled nerves as much in Washington as in Tel Aviv. President Bush and Israeli Prime Minister Shamir conferred three times by phone in two days. And Bush thanked Shamir for Israeli restraint. The U.S. had assurances Israel would not strike back immediately. Bush sent Israel Patriot air defense missiles and U.S. troops to man them. And he dispatched Deputy Secretary of State Lawrence Eagleburger to confer with the Israelis. An Israeli attack on Iraq could have another...